so since this came out, the rates of cervical cancer have, have significantly declined since that time. So it's really been a great um, advancement in, in our cancer screening. There are now differences in like when that's recommended to uh, be done on individuals because most commonly, because it, it's so common to come into contact with HPV to transmit it, it can even be transmitted through skin to skin contact. Um, so it's very easy to pick it up. So most, about 80% of people will come, will have the, the strain at some point. In this video, I interviewed my friend and naturopathic graduate, Adrian Hill. We discussed everything around HPV, how to treat HPV naturally, and how to support your body in its own healing process. With that being said, this is not medical advice, so make sure you consult your doctor before making any decisions around your health. Also, both Adrian and I have our own stories and journeys around HPV, so it's a topic that it's near and dear to our hearts. And me personally, I was you two years ago, getting an HPV diagnosis and feeling very afraid and alone and also ashamed. So I hope this video helps you feel a little bit more supported and gives you a little bit of power back that you, there's a lot of things that you can do to help support your own healing and to know that you have options and that you might not need some of these other invasive procedures that are typically recommended for women. So with that being said too, some of these procedures may be necessary, but for many of us, they are not. So again, I'm excited to give you some options and help you feel more supported in this journey. Two years ago, I did some research and I really didn't find much around HPV and especially on how to support treating HPV naturally and holistically. So I'm excited to interview Adrian. Before we get started, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our future videos. And if you haven't already, go check out our other videos on the channel. Okay, let's get started. Hi everyone, this is Adrian here with us today. She is our special guest for the day and she'll be talking to us about HPV. She's a naturopathic um, medicine student and I'll just let her introduce herself and tell us a little bit more about her and get into the HPV uh, topic. So hi Adrian. Hi, yeah, so thanks for having me on your, your channel and to talk about HPV. Um, so yeah, my name is Adrian. I am a graduate of the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine. I'm currently working on completing my license to become a naturopathic doctor. And uh, for the past few years, I've been doing a lot of research on HPV, um, and blog writing, Instagram content for a company called Papalex. And I got into this after having my own story with HPV experience with going through the process of having an abnormal pap and uh, HPV and, and all that stuff. So um, now I, I have successfully cleared the virus for a few years. Um, so just looking to share, share more knowledge and, uh, and research with other people that are going through the same thing. Awesome, yeah. Um... Like, I think we have like a similar story in the sense that we like had it, we didn't really know what it was. And like that kind of just started the research. Um, I don't know if you did a lot of your own research, but yeah, tell us so, like what HPV is and how people get it, contract it. Um, let's start there. Yeah, so HPV stands for the human papillomavirus. And it's actually part of a family of over... 200, 180 to 200 different strains of this virus. And we'll group that into like cutaneous types and mucosal types. When you're younger, you probably contracted an HPV as well. Um, those are typically the like cutaneous types that are found on our skin. They attach to our skin and live there. So you might've had like a planter wart or like some sort of wart um, on your hands and feet they commonly come onto. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually an HPV virus as well. And then the mucosal types are the ones that adhere to our like tissue lining that's in like our mouth, oral cavity, um, the cervix, the vagina, um, even on uh, the penis as well, we can get HPV. And so this is sort of the group of viruses that are more commonly associated with complications like cervical cancer or oral pharyngeal cancer and the ones that are more of concern um, later in life. So 
of those types of HPV, there's different strains, um, high risk strains and low risk strains. And they're very common within the, the population to contract an HPV. About 80% 80, 80 of individuals at some point in their life will contract um, an HPV strain. So most people have it, they just don't necessarily know that they have it. Yeah. Um, and this is because out of those different strains, the low risk strains, um, you might actually notice that you have one of those because they can cause uh, genital warts. So you will have some sort of like visual um, growth lesion that develops and they can be irritating, anxiety provoking for people. Um, and those ones, and unfortunately don't have any complications with them. They'll typically just like last on the skin for a few months and then clear on their own. There are some treatments that you can do to help um, bring down the, those lesions and, and get rid of them as well, but they rarely develop into things like cancers. So it's really the high risk strains of HPV that are of concern and that we're screening for when we're doing things like the pap test um, and that you might have found out that you have. Um, yeah, so that's sort of a, a general um, thing about the strains and the difference has to do with like different proteins that are on those viruses that allow for the virus to adhere into your genome and cause cell changes. And so what is of concern is when that virus attaches into you, it makes a home, it starts to replicate over time, and it's the persistence over time of the virus that leads to potentially having cervical cancer or a cancer develop in the future. For most people, that's like 10 to 20 years of uh, being infected to the time that you would actually develop cancer. Whereas, um, how, I mean, some, for some people it can happen within like a few years. So that's why it is important to keep an eye on it and, and to monitor it over time. Yeah, so the way you test is through a PAP, is that correct? Like yeah, so typically, the, the first screening that has um, now been incorporated into regular, um, the regular guidelines for screening for females, at least, is the, the PAP test. And this was invented in the 1950s. And since coming out of it, it's really revolutionized like the way that we see, the way that we approach cervical cancer, because it's allowed us to detect early on if there is presence of cell changes happening on the cervix so that we can monitor and take appropriate action um, if needed. So since this came out, the rates of cervical cancer have, have significantly declined since that time. So it's really been a great um, advancement in, in our cancer screening. There are now differences in like when that's recommended to uh, be done on individuals because most commonly, because it, it's so common to come into contact with HPV to transmit it. It can even be transmitted through skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, so it's oh, very wow. easy to pick it up. So most, about 80% of people will come, will have the, the strain at some point. And the highest prevalence is in, in individuals that are 18 to 30 years old. So mm -hmm. if we're doing the screening of those individuals, a lot of uh, females are gonna come back with abnormal pap tests. And so we see that quite commonly. There is some change happening with some of the, the screening guidelines to push it to a little bit later. And it can depend on where you live as well. Like Europe does it a bit later than North American countries, I know. Um, and that's because obviously you bring a lot of fear and testing and other things that come with getting that result. Um, and the conventional system doesn't have a lot of, of these preventative um, options. Their approach is really this like watch and wait um, and monitor um, approach to it. So that's where I've done a lot of work on, on how can we then fill this gap of when you've you know, had an abnormal pap test and you know you have HPV, how can you support your body? How can you uh, take action so that your next screening will be normal um, and um, you can have some control over bringing that uh, virus down? Yeah, so what are some ways to do that, to like have more of like, like proactive approach? Because like you said, like there is a fear around it because obviously no one wants to have like cervical cancer or any kind of cancer. And so when you get this diagnosis, I think, people, at least me, like you automatically feel like you're going to get cancer eventually, you know, <laughs> like you have this, like, even, even if you know that it's um, not like 
progress into that, you you know, like you, it can, so you don't really, so you want to be able to do something about it. And then if you're told like, oh, just like wait and see what happens in a year, it kind of feels a little disempowering. And there are some things that you can do. So what, what are some of those things that you would recommend? Yeah, no, exactly. It's like, everyone just goes onto Google after they hear and they yeah. search and then they find very, like very <laughs> cancer and it turns into this whole um anxiety driven thing yeah. and yeah there isn't at least in my experience of going through it i i wasn't really educated on on hpv what it was what even are the next steps what are the risks um so i think number one is like having some information about it to like reassure you bring the anxiety down in the work that I've done um, with the company Papalex, who um, has a, a supplement and, and I work on the blog and the research for them, um, mm -hmm. having interacted with so many people who've been diagnosed with HPV, there's so much uh, fear and stigma, anxiety around it after someone's been diagnosed. Um, it can really feel like, you know, it's the end of the world, I'm going to get cancer. So mm -hmm. I think before even taking anything or, or doing anything, like um, even going on the Papalex website, reading some blogs, like there's so many great resources on there to, to educate yourself on what are the risks, um, what are the chances of, of actually this developing into something serious and uh, what are the things that, that I can do. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so what we have found in, in the research is that there's a number of, um, nutrient deficiencies that are associated with having a high risk HPV infection or pers persistent infection over time. So those nutrients are ones like folate, um, vitamin C, vitamin D, um, other nutrients like vitamin E, selenium. Mm -hmm. So having low levels of, of these in the blood can lead to persistent or is associated with the uh, persistent infections. So a lot of those also associated with the, like, um, kind of like the, not prevalent, but like the likelihood that you'll like contract it too. If you have those deficiencies, are you more like, yeah, I guess not. Right. You're not more likely to get it or are you more like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think we don't know exactly if you're more likely to get it because some individuals can can be exposed to it and have contracted it, mm -hmm. but they're not showing any presence of cellular, cellular abnormalities or HPV presence. Um, so the ones that we're able to study are the ones that do have the presence of that in their their blood over time. So it's more the, the people who continue to um, show viral presence of HPV. Mm -hmm. That's where you see those deficiencies, the correlation of the deficiencies. Yeah, because those nutrients are key for the immune system function and they act as antioxidants to help bring down inflammation. So inflammation is one of chronic inflammation where our oxidative stress levels are not able to be cleared um, can lead to that viral persistence over time. So, and when we look at blood levels of these nutrients, what's highly correlated with them is also fruit and vegetable intake. So increasing your consumption of fruit and vegetables, especially those that are highly pigmented. Um, so the, those from the beta carotene lycopene family, like uh, pumpkin, bell peppers, papaya, tomatoes, um, those like highly pigmented fruits. Like, right. Veggies and fruits. Yeah. Yeah. Those ones can be helpful at increasing the, those levels of beta carotene. And then also your like leafy greens, your kales, your cruciferous vegetables. Um, those can also be helpful in, in correcting your, your folate levels and, and many other nutrients, vitamin C. So really focusing on amping up your intake of fruit and vegetables um, and just plant-based foods in general can be really helpful. Yeah. And then another thing is there's been specific herbs and other plant compounds that have been researched on their impact on clearing HPV viruses. Um, and so some of those include like the mushrooms like reishi, 
there's a compound called active hexose correlated compound, which has just been um, more recently researched in regards to HPV. And a lot of these studies are also looking at individuals who've had persistent HPV infections over time, who haven't been able to clear the infection. And then once they've been given this herbal extract, they, within six months, are seeing HPV regression. Oh, wow. So it's really cool to see how these compounds, which play with our immune system, they can increase like compounds like our natural killer cells, our um, different immune cells that help fight off viruses. Mm -hmm. And those are helping bring down the, uh, the levels of HPV. So those are really exciting. Other ones are um, DIM, uh, which is found in broccoli sprouts and broccoli cruciferous vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some research on its ability to help modulate tumor cell growth and cancer cell progression. Green tea extract is another one, which has been researched for, for HPV. Um, astrologus um, is also a wonderful immune supporting herb. So taking these in addition to you know, supporting your diet um, and then anything that kind of impacts your stress and your immune system response. So like mm -hmm. your stress, your sleep, mm -hmm. um, getting daily sunlight exposure, getting outside, going for a walk, um, your relationships. So um, mm -hmm. those factors all play a big role in, in helping support your immune system. Yeah, and I've also heard that um, like if your immune system is suppressed, like that kind of creates more of like a, you're more likely to contract it too when you're like your immune system is suppressed. So it sounds like the priority is to really work on your immune system. So A, either like you don't really get it and like fight it off or like you clear it. And that's kind of like the same thing. It's just like making sure your immune system is strong and strengthening it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It all comes down to our immune system, our hormones, our gut health, like our gut and our immune system are so connected. So even if, if you're thinking about nutrient deficiencies and maybe you do have a high intake of fruit and vegetables, but you're still having low levels of nutrients in the blood, could that be because there's something within the gut microbiome that's preventing you from, or in the digestive tract that's preventing you from absorbing those nutrients? Um, is stress taking those nutrients? Do you have other infections that are happening that might be also contributing to that? Um, one thing I also suggest is to do a, um, a workup to see if you have other vaginal infections that are going on. Mm -hmm. uh, because co-infections can also create an environment that can allow HPV to persist. So um, that's something that's also important to kind of do an assessment, go see a, a naturopathic doctor or um, another natural health practitioner who has some knowledge on this um, to see, you know, what else could be going on? Um, where are your weak spots? Um, if there's anything with like the way you might be metabolizing different nutrients and uh, then suggesting which ways to correct those. Yeah, so we've been talking about like prevent, like preventative health and like doing things to help um, improve your immune system and th strengthening, strengthening your immune system. Um, what about people, I guess, I, and like, a, this is not medical advice, you know, this is just our recommendation and our experience. But, um, so I guess this is two questions. How long does it typically take to clear out the infection, like on average, if you are like, you know, taking steps to improve it or uh, supporting your healing? And the other question is, um, how do you, yeah, what would you recommend for someone who's like, there's different procedures that are recommended a lot of the time that can be very invasive. And so would you recommend like trying like more of a natural approach at first or like, yeah, what, what do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so the first one on how long will it take to clear the infection? Mm -hmm. So typically, I mean, it depends on the individual, of course, and like what they're doing, what's going on, um, what their behaviors are like, what risk factors they have. Um, so it, it's very individual. I want to start with that. But um, if you are to be, you know, on a 
protocol that you've been put on and you're supporting your health, supporting your stress, um, sleep, doing all the things for your immune system and, and supplementing, then um, I'd see a, a good timeline is um, six to 12 months to start seeing, at least we'd want to see some progression. And typically once you get into the, the system of being identified as having an abnormal PAP, the next step would be to be referred to a gynecologist and you'd undergo a further screening, which is a colposcopy exam. So this gives a microscopic view of the cervix and they can visualize the, the cell environment a little bit better and also take a biopsy. And there they'll um, grade your level of dysplasia based off of a rating system called SIN, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. And that's rated on SIN1, SIN2, SIN3. So SIN1 is like mild dysplasia, SIN2 is moderate, and SIN3 is uh, severe. So you'll get that kind of baseline level of like where you are, how, um, how much cellular change is happening, and then your doctor will recommend to you, you know, next steps of do we need to do a procedure now, um, when will we check in next, and from my experience and from what I've heard from most others and, and what's in the guidelines is that typically a six month check-in will be booked after having that first colposcopy. So that gives you a good amount of time to, you know, work with a, a natural health practitioner to identify some goals that you can work on during that time, maybe add some supplementation in. And then by that next appointment, it's a good time to see if that level of sin has changed at all. Um, they, they may also do HPV testing in that appointment, which allows you to um, test specific strains. So do you have a high risk strain of HPV? Are you more at risk of developing cervical cancer or not? Um, and yeah, is the virus even present or not? Because it can become inactive over time. So that six month check-in is a good time to see if things have changed a little bit. And then in regards to the other procedures that they may recommend, um, obviously like that's something every individual should decide with their doctor and uh, um, not something I can like advise. There's one way to go about that, but um, I'd say if it's your first time having the colposcopy and um, your sin level is below, is two or below, then to maybe get, have a conversation with your doctor about wanting to try some natural approaches in the next six months up until your next appointment before going forward with a invasive procedure. And then if by the next appointment you're seeing some improvements, then that's a great sign that it is heading in the right direction. It can take more than six months to fully reverse. It can take even, you know, up to two, two, three years. And um, the tricky thing about the virus is that it can get reactivated. Um, once it lives in you, it, it's latent, but it can be reactivated due to vulnerabilities. Yeah, I was just going to ask that. You said that it becomes inactive, so that means that it can become active again. Um, and that is, would you say, like, again, like when your immune system is suppressed, is that when it can become active again? Exactly, yeah. Usually when there's some sort of um, compromise in the immune system, it can become inactivated. But the, our research on that topic is not that great. I don't think we know a whole lot about like persistence over time, how many individuals become um, reactivated. So um, that's just something to be, I think, mindful of uh, if you have had it in the past, that you always have that predisposition that it could, could come back and to take care of your health. But I think once you've brought down the infection, you also have that immune um, the immune players to kind of help keep it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, like you also know what to do if it does reoccur, like you kind of have like a game plan or something that, yeah, you know where to start at least, you know where to go from there. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was going to ask something else and I kind of forgot on that, but we can also go into the, um, we can touch on the vaccine. I know there's like an HPV vaccine. And so see what your thoughts are on that, what you know about that and what you think about it. 
Yeah, so there is an HPV vaccine that's been out for, I believe since 2007, 2008 is when it came out. Um, so it's only been around for a few years now, which means um, that we're just starting to see the, the outcome rates on cervical cancer mm -hmm. because it does take a few years for that to be developed. Um, but yeah, the vaccine protects against lower strains like the HPV 6 and 11, which are common in causing genital warts. And then I believe Gardasil 9 protects against seven high-risk strains that are most commonly causing the, um, the, the cancers in cervical cancer. So that's something that's often offered to individuals before they become sexually active because you want to be vaccinated before you've had any exposure to an HPV strain. That's when it's most effective. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I remember the question I was going to ask. Um, so when you are, let's say you have a negative test, like it's inactive, you have a negative test, um, then would you say like getting like checks, how often would you, I guess it depends on guidelines on each like country and each area. Um, but since it's still in you, but just inactive, what do you recommend on like PAPs and getting retested? Yeah, so typically what is recommended after you've, um, let's say you've had the abnormal PAP, then you've had the colposcopy, and now after so many years, your PAPs have gone back to normal. Your HPV is no longer longer detectable anymore. That's actually the, the situation I'm in now yeah. um, from what I've gone through. So typically after you've had that negative HPV test screen, you'll want to get a, a PAP done within a year. So it's a little sooner than the normal populations recommended to get it, which is every three years. You'd mm -hmm. want to get it done in one year. And then, yeah, it obviously depends on your, your doctor, your healthcare provider, what they want to do, also personal choice and um, the healthcare environment that you live in. Mm -hmm. um, it could be good to continue getting yearly screens for the next few years. You may decide to do that with your, your healthcare practitioner. I think some would recommend after you've, again had another normal pap after a year to go in, to go back to three year screening again so at that point they do determine that the risk is lower of um developing cervical cancer so right. yeah yeah that's good to know um yeah and another thing on the um the screening stuff because um i guess like there are so many pros and cons of of doing mm -hmm. it like early or or waiting till you're later so um yeah. yeah it really does depend on like your healthcare provider and then you're also per your personal choice so you can always decide to to do the pap screening earlier if you'd prefer to know um i'm sort of pro doing it early because i do know there's all these tools that can help with mm -hmm bringing down the virus now at least that um, there's all these things you can do but I know like maybe I wouldn't have gone through this whole journey if I had gone and done the screening when I was later in life um, yeah. and I wouldn't have even known but certainly I think once you and maybe you can test this too like once you've had the experience of going through this it it is sort of a way that shifts you into a new way of looking at your health and taking yeah. care of yourself and like even spiritually emotionally i think it helps like you kind of tap into and and become more attuned with things in your body and and even how you've been living your life so yeah in a way in a funny way you become like kind of appreciative of it in yeah. the long run yeah yeah it definitely makes you take pause and like i remember really like focusing myself on like um just thinking like reminding myself that the pri my priority at the time was to heal and to like uh, support my body so even if there were like other things like external things going on like I always like shifted my focus to what's going to help me with like healing right now and so that's how I also found I think that's how I found Papalex too was through like doing my own research and trying to like find things that were more natural that I could start doing instead of just like waiting for like the next path and just like I feel like that period if you are just told to wait what you do is like worry <laughs> instead of like 
and, and that's the opposite of what you should be doing. Like, you know, like stress and anxiety probably doesn't help you clear out the virus. So mm -hmm. for me, at least I felt that I was like taking steps that I knew, even just like as a dietitian, knowing about nutrients and nutrient deficiencies, like I knew it was going to help me in some way, even if it didn't help me clear it, I know it's going to support my body in other ways. And yeah, I really also feel, or I remember that, um, like my sleep got so much better. Like I was prioritizing sleep and, and that, that has carried with me to now. Like, it's just like, it kind of changed the way I do some things like being out more and yeah, it, it, it is kind of one of those like blessings in disguise in a way, like I have a better sleep habit and like I go out more and, and, and knowing that it's still inactive, but you still have it. I think it's like a good reminder of like, Oh, I really, need to like stay on top of my health <laughs> yeah yeah no exactly I had a similar experience where you're kind of playing around with like okay yeah. what can I do what what is going to support it and you're right even if it doesn't you know completely get rid of the the virus or I still have to do more with that like it's still every day I'm waking up and I'm feeling better I have more energy and I'm fueling myself with better nutrients and better rest and yeah yeah so I find that with a lot of a lot of people that I work with and and uh I've spoken to as well and I think also like the like looking into the energetic side of it and like the the root chakra as well is something that I get people to mm -hmm. to focus on and which has to do with like your security and your root and your belonging and and yeah, these sort of yeah. grounding things and and even boundaries I think for for women having boundaries and and who you're letting into your life and to your space can be something to to think about and um can kind of energetically build up your your strength as well yeah yeah i remember too with that like listening to someone and that's the other reason i wanted to do this video it's like when i googled stuff there wasn't much maybe there's more now but i just felt like there was like you know, WebMD kind of things, but there wasn't a lot of like conversation around it. Part of me feels like it's because it's, I feel like there's a little bit of shame around it too, because it's like a sexually transmitted virus. Um, so like people don't want to talk about it or they, I, I don't really know, but there was really wasn't much on it. I did find some, someone on YouTube that was talking about like visualizing too, like the visualizing like healing or like visualizing the bright light around your like pelvic area and just I think that also like helped me um just like the visualizing of like health and like life within your cervical area and yeah even if that sounds a little bit like woo to people I think I think it can be really transformative in a way yeah no I, I totally agree yeah it does sound it yeah. it can sound a little like oh crazy but like it, it does help you connect with with your body and what it's communicating to you. And I like to see symptoms as like our messengers from our body. So like yeah. really sit down and just do those visualizations, do those meditations and um, even journaling can be really helpful. I think too. Yeah. 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 It brings like that like presence, like you, like you're saying, like it's like a sign from your body. I think kind of like a little bit of a nudge to like be more present in that moment with your body yeah 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 so so many things that that good okay. things that that come out of it, too. it yeah in your experience with uh with going through hpv and uh and everything like what have been your biggest learnings yeah um i think when you mentioned boundaries i think that was a good one i think my my boundary was more of like like back going back to like I'm the priority in the moment and like this is my priority so other things can take like a back burner um things that like I think we kind of like yeah like things that are, are not really important but they seem important in the moment when you have something like this you're like oh like that's not as important right now and so that became like this like energetic priority in, in my mind of like I really didn't like necessarily set a priority with people but I was just like I'm doing things to help me so it kind of became this like selfish in a selfish way like I was a priority um yeah and I think 
focusing on like health and nutrients. I think that was another one because sometimes we can get a little lax on that too. And I think it kind of reminded me of like, oh yeah, like, yeah, like there are things that I could be doing more or better. And um, like, I, like I started t taking Papilex, which you sent me like some samples for, so thank you. Um, and I think my biggest one also was sleep. I think sleep. I didn't realize how much sleep I could actually get until I started prioritizing it. And I sleep like 10 hours a night and that seems like right for me. And yeah. like my family makes fun of me because they like sleep like seven to eight hours and they think like I sleep like a baby. And I'm like, yeah, I, like I love sleep now. <laughs> and I think it all kind of started with that. I was like, I, and I knew how much sleep can help you help your immune system like it helps everything like it helps your hormone balance for people with hormone imbalance and it really almost feels like a foundational piece to a lot of um other conditions like not so much i think nutrients are super powerful and like exercise and it also seems to me like sleep is like that foundation and then other things build on that yeah it's so important it's such one that we take for granted too yeah we're like oh we don't need sleep but yeah, even focusing on that one one piece can bring so much more health to to so many people. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you really so much for like bring coming in and telling us everything you know about Papilex and HPV and your experience and sharing with us today. Is there anything that you wanted to touch on that we didn't talk about or any question that you wish somebody would ask you about it? Hmm. I feel like we did touch on a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I think we touched on on, on most of it. Um, and then, yeah, if you're watching this and you want more information, um, check out um, papilex.com. Um, the supplement includes all the nutrients that I've talked about and um, was really helpful for me to clear my HPV. Um, the Instagram page also has a lot of um, information on it. So I think that's a really valuable resource for for others to to have um where can people find you too like, yeah so my instagram is aid hill a y d e h i l l um so that's where i post most of my my information right now hopefully we'll come out with some more um a, a website and and everything soon but uh yeah instagram is the main platform that i that i post on yeah, and you're also about to graduate, so I'm guessing like you'll be taking clients on soon as well. Yeah, probably in uh, in about like six to eight months, I'll be okay. fully licensed and okay. uh, can can do that. Um, so yeah, I'll stay in touch with my Instagram, and you can find out more there um, when I'll be taking on clients again. Awesome. Thank you so much again. And yeah, if you want to learn more about uh, Adrian, go check her Instagram and then Papilex Instagram. I think it's, yeah, there's like a lot of information there. So, and you, you're you behind that right now, right? Yeah, I'm actually just about to hand it over to, to someone else as I graduate. But uh, yeah, all the things that I've written and it'll continue to, to be uh, active after me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, we'll it's next time. So there you have it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you found this inf information helpful and supportive. And that maybe you found a little bit of peace through your own HPV healing journey. As we mentioned earlier, too, you can find the HPV healing support guide in the description below. And remember, this is not medical advice. So make sure you always consult with your medical doctor before you make any changes to your own health care. If you found this helpful and you know of other women who will benefit from it, make sure you share it with them. And also make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss any of the future videos that we will share here on the channel. Okay guys, thank you so much for being here again and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.